I am has come. God, the Almighty, entered time, space, and matter. Took on flesh. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The only way to heaven. That's why we celebrate. We don't celebrate because of that. Lights. The presents. The tinsel. We celebrate because the bread of life has given us nourishment for eternity. We celebrate because we have hope. Hope because the light of the world shined upon the darkness of humanity and gave us answers that last forever. We celebrate Christmas because there's compassion. Because Jesus, the resurrection and the life, said, I'm going to give life to you even though you were dead, if you believe. To anyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus. That's why we celebrate but you know, when you look around the world, culture has it pretty confused. I mean, it's almost like they're blinded. Like they can't see what really is going on. And all they see is the Santa, the tree, the presents, the wrapping paper. But that's the way Satan wants it to be. He doesn't want anybody to have their focus on Jesus. He doesn't want anybody in culture to know that there's hope beyond these few short years of life. That they can have life more abundant. That their sins can be forgiven if they put their faith and trust in Jesus. So what does he do? He tries to make this thing, the birth of Jesus, seem legendary. Like a myth. At its best, a good story. But we know different, don't we? Because the Bible makes it very clear. God said, there's going to come a time when there's going to be a virgin who's going to bear a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. God is the flesh. You know, those words are easy to read. They're easy to say, but much harder to grasp. And so this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to hold that truth in our hand and see how clear it becomes as we walk through the Word this morning and how it makes a difference in your Christmas and my Christmas in 2023. You ready to jump into the Word of God? You have your Bibles? Hold them up. Repeat after me. This is the word of God. This is the word of God. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. It's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I love the word of God. And I love the word of God. Father, we thank you for your word today. Speak to us clearly. Take us farther and deeper in our understanding and our walk with you. May everyone forget my words, but may they remember yours. We pray this in your powerful name, Jesus, and all God's people said. Amen. 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 Take your Bibles, open up to the New Testament, to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you're unfamiliar with navigating in a Bible, again, all Bibles have a table of contents at the beginning. Find that. Find the Old Testament, New Testament. Once you find the New Testament, find Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament. And we're going to start in chapter 1. If you have a tablet or a phone, it's easy enough. You don't have to turn pages. Go, boop. And you get right to Luke. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 as we begin. And we're going to start reading in verse 26. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. If you're there, say amen. Amen. If you're not, say, please wait for me. Okay, right, you're right there. Way to go, Bible students. Verse 26. Now in the sixth month. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in he said to her, Hail favored one, the Lord 
is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be? I am a virgin. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed <coughs> from her. Well, the truth that I just read to you, well, is pretty common. We've heard that before, haven't we? But for Mary, this was the beginning of a whole new adventure. God was going to do something amazing. He was going to take away the sin of the world, fulfill all the prophecies in the Old Testament, and guess where he started? With a young virgin named Mary. Now, Mary had no idea what God was going to do. I mean, I'm sure she wondered. She had doubt, but her faith was even better because she said, yeah, if that's what you would like to do, God, use me. I mean, this was really out of the ordinary for Mary. It caught her probably by surprise. Think about you. If an angel appeared to you, that would catch you by surprise. I mean, it almost sounded like this was going to be impossible. God was inviting Mary on a journey into her and said, how could this be? Well, obviously she questioned and she said, I don't know, because I'm a what? I'm a virgin. I'm a virgin. But yet in the midst of this, God was going to do an amazing miracle and take Mary on a very exciting journey. She had no idea. But yet, she obeyed, didn't she? She simply obeyed. And I want you to just let that sink in for just a minute. Because sometimes we pass by that too quickly. Because when Mary obeyed, she put herself in a very tough situation. Do you realize that in first century AD, if as a young woman who was engaged, you were accused of adultery before you got married, you would be shunned from your family. You would be an outcast from your city. You would be branded an adulteress. No hope of ever getting married because no man would ever want to be married to an adulteress. Nobody to take care of you for the rest of your life. And besides, your reputation is ruined. Then, when you started to show, things got worse. Because under the law of Moses, if you became pregnant before your marriage, the law said you were to be stoned. And Mary said, okay, to God. 
She was in a tough situation. But what about Joseph? What about Joseph? I mean, the Bible says that Joseph was a righteous man. And because he was a righteous man, he was engaged to Mary. He knew that this was going on and that Jesus was conceived. The Bible says that he wanted to put Mary away. He wanted to hide her. You know why? Because he knew if anybody found out that she was pregnant, what would happen? In the midst of that dilemma, the Bible says an angel came to Joseph in his sleep and said, Joseph, don't be afraid. Take Mary as your wife. Joseph's in a tough situation because, hey, if people hear that Mary is pregnant, Joseph is considered a sinner. And you know, in his community, he's going to be ostracized. No one's going to want to do work with a carpenter who's a sinner. The next step would be, when the religious people found out, he'd be kicked out of the synagogue. Never again allowed to worship in the place where he grew up. Mary and Joseph. They're in a tough situation. Push the pause button for a minute. Let me ask you a question. In 2023, what would you do if you were in a tough situation? What do you do in a tough situation? Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Do you run? Do you hide? Do you panic? Or do you hold on to Jesus? Think about that, because as we step into a brand new year, the reality is, is if you're a Christ follower, you will probably have to deal with some tough situations. Don't run. Don't hide. Hold on to Jesus and worship. Amen? Amen. Let's read out a little bit more. Let's go to chapter 2. Verse 1. Now it came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabitants of earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all were proceeding to register for the census, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. Came about, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son as she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. You know, when we hear that part of the story, most of us kind of romanticize it a little bit, don't we? I mean, when we think of this picture of Jesus being born, well, we usually think of the stars brightly shining, right? Mary and Joseph, their silhouette against the moon. Oh, and the music is slowly rising. And the animals, well, they're bowed low in the manger, worshiping the Son of God. Probably because we've seen so many Hallmark cards, huh? You know, when you look back in time and history, that probably wasn't the way that it was. The trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem. When you look at a map, it's a little over 70 miles. A 70 mile trip. In those days, the most people traveled by foot or with an animal was about 20 miles a day. 
So, approximately a three and a half day journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And when you go back in time and history, you also find out that this trip happened during the winter months in the Middle East. In the Middle East in the winter, temperatures during the day are between 30 and 40 degrees, usually a lot of rain, and at night they can dip below freezing. So can you imagine being nine months pregnant, Amanda, and traveling, I say that to Amanda because she just had a new baby, and traveling for three and a half days on a donkey or walking in temperatures that are 30 to 40 degrees and then in the <coughs> evening could dip below freezing. And then when you arrive at your destination, there's no place for you. So they had to find some place to stay, obviously. Found a place, a stable. And I'm sure they did their best. But there's things that are out of their control, huh? Like the noisy animals, the coolness in the air, maybe a little bit of unsanitary surroundings. I bet God is up in heaven going, oh my goodness, how, how could this have happened? I, I mean, he was probably surprised by all of this, right? No, because God had planned this all. It was his perfect timing. God had planned out for Emmanuel to take on human flesh and enter into time, space, and matter at that exact same time. Time and place. He knew everything that was going on. See, the arrival of Jesus signaled a brand new era. I am just entered time, space, and matter so that we could actually see him, touch him, and he could show us how much he loved us. And that was all fleshed out in Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. And looking back in time, one by one, people began to believe that he is Messiah. He is God in the flesh. Fishermen believe. Tax collectors believe. Samaritans believe. Poor people believe. Soon, People all over were realizing and understand the truth that I am has come. And they begin to write songs, sing praises, tell stories, arrange his teachings so that they could be in memorable form. And they begin to do it, the Bible says, with lots of energy, with lots of gusto. Why did they do that? Well, because... As they looked around, they understood there's no way they could make it to heaven on their own. No way. They couldn't be good enough. They couldn't go to the synagogue enough. The rules that the Pharisees and Sadducees had, they could never keep them. But when they met Jesus, his arms were open wide and said, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give to them eternal life, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. So people came, young and old. Those that were injured and had been healed, those who had no hope, they came because they realized that I am has come. Jesus, who offers hope. See, the Bible speaks of what theologians call the hypostatic union. It's a big word. Some of you probably heard that, the hypostatic union. What that is talking about is the reality that Jesus took on two 
complete natures. He is 100% God and 100% man. He's not 50% God, 50% man. He is 100% God and 100% man combined together, and those natures will always be together. They cannot be separated. The hypostatic union. We understand that. We hear the words, oh, the incarnation. Oh, that makes sense. Or we might call it the enfleshment of God. God took on human flesh. And I know this time of the year we focus on his birth, but we can never forget the context into which he was born. Because Jesus was born to end up on a cross. Jesus was born the perfect Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world so that anyone who would put their faith and trust in him could have their sins forgiven. The Lamb of God. See, there's no mistaking what went on. God knew the timing of his plan. He had prophesied it hundreds of years before. He knew the place where Jesus was to be born. That wasn't an accident that there was this census and all of a sudden they had to go to Bethlehem. No, God had that plan. It was his perfect timing. The Messiah's birth some 2,000 years ago proves that he is God in the flesh because it is the fulfillment of thousands of years of prophecy to the T. But the truth is, there's a lot of people in the culture that we live in that don't believe that. I was playing tennis with my friend Dan on Friday. He said, Merry Christmas, Dan. He said, Merry Christmas, Kim. I said, hey, Dan. Don't forget, it's all about Jesus. He goes, I knew you'd remind me. <laughs> See, there's a lot of people. They're blinded. Blinded to the reality that Christmas is about Jesus. But that's the way the enemy wants it. You and I know, no, no, no. It's not about the trees, the lights, the bling, the Christmas presents, the wrapping paper. It's about I am becoming flesh. And that's the question that all people have to ask. Who is Jesus? Who is he? It's a question that's been asked throughout the ages. In fact, it's a question that Jesus asked his own disciples. He asked them, who do you say I am? It's a question you had to answer. It's a question my friend Dan has to answer. It's a question culture has to answer. Because Jesus is either everything that mankind needs, or he's nothing, it's just a legend. We're here today because we know. He's everything, isn't he? Amen. He's everything. He is God in the flesh. He is the great I am who entered time, space, and matter, took on flesh, lived his life, died on the cross, shed his blood, so that people like you and I can have our eyes open have our sins forgiven, and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is hope for us. Because we're going to take our last breath. We don't know when. Could be this afternoon. I have a good friend of mine, younger than me. She's suffering with dementia. We got a note that hospice is there, making her as comfortable as possible, and she's going to see Jesus pretty quick. You know what's good about that story? She's going to see Jesus. Amen. Because she loves him. He has forgiven her of her sins. 
And yes, she may struggle. The Bible says, do not lose heart. Though your outer man is decaying, yet your inner man is being renewed day by day. The momentary light affliction is producing for us. When we see the struggle, we have hope in Jesus. That's what we celebrate Christmas Eve morning, isn't it? That's why you're here. That's why I'm here. Because we know Jesus is our Savior and Redeemer. Amen. Lord Jesus, we are humbled to be able to enjoy your presence this morning. We thank you for your word that again opens the door to the reality that happened 2,000 years ago. And that reality has changed our lives so that one day, 2,000 years from now, we will be able to be enjoying your presence. And 2,000 years from then, and 2,000 years from then, because we will be there for eternity. And we're humble. So today, as we step out of this place and continue on in our journey, we realize that every moment is in your hands. And so we crawl up on your lap again this morning, Lord Jesus, and that's where we rest. We love you. We pray this in your powerful name. And all God's people said, Amen. And a simple song to end with this morning. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him. In Christ. Amen. You guys have a great, enjoyable day today. If you make it back tonight, Love to have you here. Enjoy your time with your family and friends tomorrow and this week. And never, ever forget Jesus is the answer. Love you guys. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. And maybe we'll see you tonight. Here's the